Some of the most memorable moments in Final Fantasy games come from just barely scraping your way through a battle to claim a hard-won victory. And throughout the franchise's history, there have been many bosses, super bosses, and hunting marks that have left a lasting impression on fans for this exact reason. Many would be fun and challenging, but occasionally, some bosses cross the line into being a little bit unfair and, dare we say, cheap, and have become infamous amongst players as a result. Now, the definition of being cheap will vary from player to player, but what often defines a cheap boss versus a hard one was the addition of an element that seemed to go against the established rules or mechanics of the game. These could be permanent buffs, full heals that negated all progress made, or a specifically underhanded attack pattern or combo. All things that either required more than just grinding to get past, or specific knowledge about what lay in wait. Now we've covered a cohort of cheap bosses in the past, featuring the likes of Ruby Weapon, Vigraph, Zodiac, and Ozma. And for today's video, we're going to be shining the spotlight on some more. But there's going to be a special distinction. For this list, we will only be featuring bosses that you all thought we missed the last time around. It means that yes, we combed through the thousands of comments left on that previous video to identify some of the most cunning and crafty bosses that you thought Final Fantasy had to offer, with the typical caveat of course of only focusing on one entry per game. So without further ado, here's another 7 cheap bosses who just didn't play fair, as selected by Final Fantasy Union's own comment section. And we're going to kick things off with the reincarnation of Unaleska's spirit, Chak. While we've covered the Via Infinito in the past, we focused mainly on the challenge of the dungeon as a whole and its final obstacle, Tremor. As many commenters let us know though, there's a good reason to revisit the vast underbelly of Bavel when discussing the subject of cheapest bosses, and that reason is Chak. Featured as the boss of floor 80 within Via Infinito, and then encountered on subsequent floors as a regular enemy, Chak was a serpentine menace whose cheapness all boiled down to its signature abilities. Status effects are a staple of cheap and difficult bosses, with most trying to poison, silence, blind, or doom the player, rendering them either useless, annoyed, or in the worst cases, defeated. For its part, Chak forwent these more common trademarks, and instead went straight for something even more annoying and difficult to counter, the Petrify Break combination. To start, Chak would use its stony glare ability to deal non-elemental damage while possibly petrifying its target, an outcome that was quite likely as stony glare could cause petrification regardless of any player immunities that were equipped. Once a character was petrified, they were then at risk of being broken and removed from the battle, either by Chak's quick physical attacks or by its second signature ability, Heaven's Cataract. What made this ability so fiendish was the fact that outside of being able to break petrified characters, Heaven's Cataract additionally dealt a large amount of non-elemental damage to the entire party, and lowered the party's defense, magic defense, accuracy, evasion, and luck. As Chak had a naturally high agility stat, and liked to use Heaven's Cataract at the drop of a hat, taking it down would prove to be quite the ordeal for any party not at the highest level with the right dress spheres maxed out. Multiple strategies do exist though for making this battle a little bit easier, but at the end of the day, dealing with Chak's rapid fire abuse with a petrify status that could land regardless of immunities seemed to break age old established rules around status effects, and when combined with everything else, was just a bit too unfair. When Final Fantasy 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 were released on the Game Boy Advance, a lot of new content was added to complement other quality of life changes. From new bosses, to new items, to new dungeons, a ton of replayability and challenge was added for new and returning players alike. Not all of this new content offered a fair and reasonable test of skill though. Sometimes, in an effort to really make players sweat, Square Enix upped the ante just a tad too far, and one of the best examples of this could be seen from Final Fantasy V Advance's Archaeodemon. A curious addition to this list, due to it actually being a fairly low-leveled enemy, the Archaeodemon was found inside the sealed temple alongside a whole host of other extremely powerful bosses and monsters. What really set it apart though, and made it a cheap encounter, was its particularly infuriating set of abilities. Being undead, the Archaeodemon was immune to statuses such as death, 
but unlike other undead enemies, it was also immune to revival magic such as Rays or Phoenix Downs that would normally provide an easy win. To make matters worse, Archaeo Demon also absorbed all elemental damage, including Holy, and was permanently buffed with the Protect status for any physical attacks. Not that it mattered, because if physical attacks did land, the Archaeo Demon would then cast Death on itself for a full heal, undoing any progress the party might have made up until that point. If that wasn't enough, the Archaeo Demon would also hit players fast and hard, with abilities such as Drain Touch, Flare, Mega Flare, and even Giga Flare. And after its health dropped below 200,000 HP, this would then be complemented by Meteor, Holy Death, and Hurricane. All of these abilities had the potential to completely wipe the party, regardless of preparation, and when coupled with its previously mentioned defensive traits, it's no surprise that many players have a tough time making any sort of dent against this boss. In short, the Archaeo Demon is a nasty piece of work, and to overcome its cheap mechanics, players would need some meticulous planning. Final Fantasy X featured many notorious bosses, with Lady Unileska often mentioned whenever the topic of hard or cheap bosses comes up. Today though, we will specifically not be talking about Unileska, because as many of you noted in the comments of the previous video, she was not the only unfair difficulty spike that featured as part of Final Fantasy X's main scenario. Encountered at the top of Mount Gagazette, our next entry, Seymour Flux, is frequently described as the reason players abandon playthroughs of Final Fantasy X whenever the game is brought up. Now even though players had encountered Seymour before, what set this fight apart from others, and really pushed it into the realm of cheapness, was how he blindsided players with his use of abilities and tactics that up until this point in the game were not really factors that players had to deal with or might even be aware of. To begin, Seymour appeared with his companion and steed Mortiorkis, who would support him and follow his previous attacks with attacks of its own, creating brutal two-hit combos that could really level underprepared or under-equipped parties. Chief amongst these combos was Seymour's Lance of Atrophy, which damaged and inflicted zombie status on a character followed by Mortiorkis, casting full life on the afflicted character for an instant death. Second, and the one most burned into players' memories, was the Total Annihilation attack. Taking two turns to charge, this attack saw Mortiorkis do a multi-hit, party-wide attack, causing thousands of points of damage that could easily lead to an instant game over. These weren't the only cheap tactics everyone's favourite maester pulled though. Throughout the battle, Seymour would cast Dispel on the party, followed by a party-wide physical attack from Mortiorkis called Cross Cleave, set up Reflect on himself, and then use that to bounce flare spells onto the player, buff himself with Protect, and finally banish any Aeons summoned by Yuna that lingered around too long. All of this combined to make Seymour Flux a fight that really seemed to come out of nowhere for a lot of players who were scraping by in the main scenario by neglecting mechanics such as weapons and armor abilities, or by not keeping up with their sphere grid progression. As Final Fantasy XIII represented a large shift in the series with regards to how battles and resource management played out, it's no surprise that the game featured some really tough encounters that put the player's skills to the test. And in that regard, even battles against regular enemies were made difficult enough that they could cause game overs if the player wasn't alert. Once reaching Grand Pulse and having the game open up with regards to side quests, the player had the option of putting the main scenario on hold to seek out additional combat challenges for worthwhile rewards. Some of these, such as Longui or the Fort Warrens, are well known to players, but as some of you pointed out in the previous video, none fit the theme of Cheap Boss quite like Vercingetorix. Found in the Padrian Archaeopolis, Vercingetorix was the most powerful undying type enemy in the game and featured over 15 million hit points as well as strength and magic ratings above 4000. A flying foe, Vercingetorix had multiple sets of wings, and these played a part into what made it so cheap in a big way, as the number of wings it sported dictated the potency of its assault, and this only got more intense as the battle wore on. Vercingetorix would sprout additional wings as its health dropped below 90%, 60%, and 30% respectively. It would in turn affect the number of times its wing shear attack would hit the player, potentially hitting up to 27 times at full strength. Impenetrable Aura, its healing ability, would also add a variety of buffs depending on how many wings it had, as well as resetting the chain gauge, making it immune to damage, and gradually recovering Vercingetorix's health. 
To make this uphill battle even more infuriating, it also attacked with an ability called Putrescence after losing 90% of its HP, which removed Bust from the player. Wicked Whirl, which would hit up to 19 times while launching the target, and much like many other bosses, it would cast Doom on the player, meaning that they would see a game over if they failed to take the boss down within 30 minutes. In order to survive the endless assault and emerge victorious, the player's party would need to come to the fight with nearly maxed out Crystariums and some of the best equipment. Taking advantage of status effects like Poison would also help to make this fight a little more manageable once First and Getrix got going, but overall the likelihood of failure was still quite high. Now the Tombri was mentioned in the comments of the previous video perhaps more than anything else. But even though they are cheap and often horrible enemies, with the Mega Tombri and even the Tombris in Stranger of Paradise being fine examples of this, those are just normal enemies. In reality, even though there have been a few boss tier Tombris featured throughout the years, not too many have been that cheap. So for this entry we decided to go for a slight technicality and focus on Tombri Notorious Monsters from Final Fantasy XI, and we've done so for one specific reason, Tonbury Hate. Tonbury Hate was introduced as a global modifier that influenced the potency of the Everyone's Grudge ability, and based on how it was calculated, it was unique to every player. Behind the scenes, the game would keep track of how many Tonbury monsters each character had slain. This would then be linked to the Everyone's Grudge ability, so for every Tonbury the player defeated, the more damage they would take if they were hit by the ability. If the player continued, things would eventually reach a level wherein any Tonbri who used the ability had the potential to completely decimate a player with a single attack. While this made rank and file Tonbris difficult, it made the notorious monster versions, which were unique super boss type enemies, even worse. This was due to the fact that notorious monster Tonbris, such as the trio faced in the Temple of Ugalepi, had a more powerful version of Everyone's Grudge called Everyone's Rancor, which was capable of dealing 10 times the damage of Everyone's Grudge. If the player had a Tonbri hate level high enough, this made the trio, and indeed the temple itself, extremely perilous, and completing either could basically become impossible. The only workaround was that the player could reset Tonbri hate through paying an NPC, making things a little bit easier for themselves, but this was locked behind a side quest, and the acquisition of a key item known as the Tonbri key, meaning to do so did require some effort. Overall, the Tonbri notorious monsters from Final Fantasy XI collectively represented a variety of cheap encounter that left the player with little recourse when it came to dealing with them, and this was especially true if the player wasn't even aware the Tonbri hate mechanic existed. Final Fantasy IV featured a lot of bosses with mechanics that would really challenge the player to think and strategize. But as there were no super bosses included within the original version of the game, it wasn't until the release of the 3D remake on the Nintendo DS that the game would gain a rather unfair super boss of its own that would stand up against some of the worst in the franchise. The prototype of the Giant of Babel seen in the main scenario of the game Proto Babel was fought on the moon, and the initial challenge was even just triggering the fight. Summoning this monstrosity required the player to steal the Dark Matter item from Zeromus in the final battle on a previous playthrough, and then make it to the moon a second time while playing New Game Plus. The fight could then be started by interacting with the stone face on the moon's surface. Two playthroughs of the game were more or less required to even challenge Proto Babel, but an additional run of New Game Plus was recommended if players wanted to come out on top, and this was because Proto Babel was at level 99 and had 400,000 HP, meaning the player should only attempt the fight after maxing out all their stats and equipping the party with the best possible gear, as well as having the best augments. Anything less would simply be not enough. Even after all this prep, Proto Babel still hit hard with attacks like Light of Babel, which could easily deal 9,999 damage, or Ninth Dimension, which could instantly kill targets. After it lost a third or so of its health, Proto Babel would then begin to restore its own health to a tune of 20,000 HP per attempt, but it would also gain access to its ultimate attack, Divine Judgment, which could deal over 6,000 damage to the entire party. As a final trick up its sleeve, Proto Babel could counter the player's attacks with Object 199, an ability which would cause extreme, non elemental damage to a single target. All things considered, what makes Proto Babel so deserving of being on this list was the fact that outside of just forging ahead and being well equipped, there was no real quick wins to be had. 
Proto-Babel hit like a truck and was hard to hit in any meaningful way itself, which made it a risk at any level and easily the toughest and cheapest boss to appear within the Final Fantasy IV remake. Final Fantasy V was notable for featuring the franchise's first two official super bosses. Both became infamous amongst fans, and today we're going to focus on the legendary Shinryu, as it was called out amongst the commenters way more than Omega. Now, we have already featured Archaeodemon as part of this video, but the technicality here is that Shinryu featured in the original Super Famicom version of Final Fantasy V, whereas Archaeodemon was only found in the Game Boy Advance and Mobile versions, which are separate instances of the game, and besides, they're both brutal. Shinryu could be found by the player in the interdimensional rifts in a sanctum, and even its appearance was cheap, as it was a monster in the box associated with the Ragnarok. This could catch unprepared players by complete surprise, often leading to a near instant game over, as Shinryu featured 55,500 HP, 51,000 MP, and no elemental weaknesses, as well as a horrible moveset. To start, Shinryu would sucker punch the party with Tidal Wave, which could cause up to 8,000 points of water elemental damage to each party member, easily wiping parties that were unaware it was coming. After this initial assault, Shinryu would then let loose with a variety of blue and elemental magic, causing a wide array of status effects such as poison, old, and zombie, and would buff itself through Mighty Guard, which granted it the protect, shell, and float statuses. Dodging or defending against Shimryu's party-wide nukes, instant death styles and petrification attacks, not to mention keeping ahead of it with haste, were essential for success and meant even experienced players had their hands full juggling the offensive and defensive actions required, often able to do little more than react and deal damage when able. Unlike all of the more sadistic entries on this list though, Shinryu was not without convenient workarounds. It was luckily classified as a dragon enemy and was therefore susceptible to attacks and weapons that dealt extra damage to that enemy type. To add to this, it was also possible to berserk the devilish dragon, removing its whole moveset, and its signature opener, Tidal Wave, could be completely blocked with a full set of coral rings which could absorb the damage. That being said, without knowledge of these tricks, and even with, Shinryu still posed a potent threat and is well deserving of a place on this list. And that, as they say, is that. These were another 7 cheap Final Fantasy bosses who just didn't play fair, as recommended by Final Fantasy Union's own commenters. But across the two lists, there are still probably a few we didn't cover, so let us know in the comments below which boss you found to be the cheapest in the series so far, and if you enjoyed the video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Galson, Dikujata, Gregory and Lord of Morning, or Super Special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.